TCC, welcome to church. We are so glad that you joined us online today. My name is Becca and this is Pastor Ryan. Hey TCC, today marks our first week of our new sermon series, Beauty for Ashes. And I'm really looking forward to walking through the season of Lent together, culminating in a celebration on Easter Sunday. That's right. I am really looking forward to this series, Ryan, and I can't wait to see how the Lord will move and challenge us over the next few weeks. Yeah, me too, Becca. Well, as you may have noticed, the worship team has been introducing some new songs lately, and they'll probably have more to come during this new series. If you'd like to be able to listen to the songs that we sing here throughout the week, be sure to check out our TCC worship playlist on Spotify. So Spotify is a music streaming service for all your devices, and the link directly to that playlist can be found in your TCC weekly email. We're also really excited about building our creative teams back up for all kinds of exciting media projects and promotions in the coming year. If that sounds intriguing to you and you want to know more about what those teams look like, check out the weekly email we send each Thursday from the TCC office. If you do not yet receive those emails and would like to, you can contact us at the office anytime and we'll get you added to the list. One more thing before we jump back into worship. Last Sunday, we got to celebrate two infant baptisms. Everly Jade Wilson and Barrett William Visser were baptized at our South Campus service, and we got to come alongside their parents and promise to pray for and support these little ones as they grow. 
It is so awesome to see parents dedicating their children to the Lord and promising to do all they can to help them develop a relationship with Jesus. What an amazing thing to witness. It really is so special, Ryan, and I just love baptisms. Well, if this is your first time tuning in to TCC today, we are so grateful that you chose to join us for church. I hope you enjoy worshiping with us, and if you'd like to connect with any of our staff members or find out more about TCC, please feel free to reach out this week. We would love to hear from you. We are going to throw it back to the band on stage now as we continue with our time of worship, and I invite you to join us as we sing. Whether this last week has you feeling like you're on top of a mountain or in the lowest valley, I encourage you to take the words of these songs to heart. Raise a hallelujah with everything inside of you today because our God is worthy of nothing less than our all. Let's worship together now. Take it away, team.
Hey, thanks for tuning in today. My name is Ty Davis and I'm one of the pastors here at TCC and I'm so excited to share the Word of God with you wherever you're watching from. Today we're starting a brand new series on Lent. Lent, literally meaning springtime, is the liturgical season of death leading to new life. Lent confronts us with our own mortality and reminds us that all is not right in the world. Sin is pervasive and we are humbled by the sorrow and pain of which we hear and see on a daily basis. Lent is a season where we are encouraged to lament and mourn this sad reality. However, it's also a season of preparation as we hold on tight to the beauty and redemption brought through Jesus Christ. While we mourn that all is not as it should be, we also celebrate that he will make all things right. Lent reminds us that our hope resides not in the world as we know it, but in God's beautiful plan to redeem it. Beauty for Ashes is the name of our series leading up uh, to Easter, and today I have the pleasure of kicking us off. You know, I still remember the first time I heard about Lent. I was a freshman in high school, and I noticed a lot of people, including some of my friends, had ash on their foreheads. And I didn't know what they were doing, so I asked a friend of mine what it was, and he simply said, it's Lent, to which I responded, no, that's definitely ashes. And the best my friend could do was tell me that it's a church thing. He was a Portuguese guy who went to the Catholic Church, and I grew up in the Nazarene Church, and as a young Christian, I didn't know what was going on, but since it wasn't a part of our tradition at the Naz, I never gave it much thought again. And Lent took on one meaning in my life, the stuff that comes out of the dryer and sticks to your clothes. Flash forward to a month ago, and we're sitting in staff meeting when Pastor Ryan asked what we do for Lent here at TCC, which got us all thinking. You know, this isn't a nece uh, necessarily a tradition of ours at TCC with respect to Ash Wednesday. But as Christians in a diverse community of Reformed believers, Baptists, Nazarenes, and Catholics, among others, I think that it's good for us to know what Lent is all about. So today, I want to start our series by defining what it is, take a look at how it started, examine what it means for us in our denomination, and most importantly, what it means for us individually in regards to our personal walk with Christ. So let's pray and dive right into some riveting church history. Father God, we seek to know you and your bride, the church, more and more. I pray that you would give us wisdom and discernment as we take in your word and as we listen to our forefathers in the faith who have gone before us. Help us to better understand Lent for our own spiritual maturity and for the building up and equipping of others during this season. In your name we pray. Amen. So, what is Lent? Well, Lent is a time of repentant preparation for Easter. And in 325 AD, the first ecumenical council of the Christian church took place in Nicaea, or modern-day Turkey, to solve the problem of Arianism, which was a heresy that proposed that Christ was not divine, but a created being. That doesn't mean much for us uh, for Lent, but at this council, these church leaders attempted to establish a uniform date for Easter. And it was their framework that was built upon that provided us with a schedule for when Lent takes place and how long it should last. And in the Western church, Lent begins on Ash Wednesday, but I'm sure you already knew that thanks to Pastor Ryan who put out a great kickoff video for us on social media. Now from Ash Wednesday, we have six and a half weeks before Easter, which provides us with 40 days for fasting, prayer, and preparing our hearts. So where did the 40 days come from and when did this practice start? I guess we shouldn't be too surprised since the number 40 is used quite often in the Bible from the 40 day flood, the embalming of Jacob, to the Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses fasted for 40 days twice, and Elijah traveled for 40 days without food after slaying the prophets of Baal. The number 40 just seems like the perfect amount of time to prepare for Easter. But the most common claim is that the 40 days are an imitation of Jesus' fasting in the wilderness before he began his public ministry found in Luke chapter 4. One issue with this notion raised by many Reformed scholars and pastors is that this, only, this is the only time that the Bible mentions Jesus fasting for 40 days, and even then, it's only found in the book of Matthew and Luke. So what makes this story of 40 days any more special than the rest of God's work, and is it really the reason for today's Lent season? Well, before the Council of Nicaea, the length of the fast leading up to, the East, uh, to Easter varied from place to place across generations. In the latter half of the second century, Greek bishop Irenaeus of Lyons and the early Christian author Tertullian tell us that the fasting lasted one or two days or 40 hours commemorating the length of time that Jesus spent in the tomb. That's different. Then by the mid third century, the fast was closer to six days in some regions on up to three weeks for the Christians in Rome. And by the mid fourth century, 40 days was the new normal just about everywhere. 
And this new normal took place at an important time because morale in the post-apostolic church was low and Lent provided a much needed boost for the church. It became something to rally around together and point them back to Christ. But it also helped prepare and weed out the increasing number of former, former pagans who wanted to be baptized, which leads us to a major shift. Many theologians believe that this period of preparation and fasting started before the Easter festival by the apostles themselves or in the immediate post-apostolic period at the latest. And the prevailing thought is that fasting became closely linked to the preparations that were being made for Easter adult baptisms, which were a key component of the apostolic leaders and observed everywhere throughout the church since its earliest days. But something major happened in 313 AD. Rome was the world's superpower and the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. Shortly thereafter, he made it legal for Roman citizens to become Christians, even going as far as to recommend that Roman citizens be baptized. And overnight, the church had an explosion of new baptisms to celebrate. Now this sounds awesome to a generation and a culture who rarely sees an adult baptism anymore. But as you can imagine, this created a challenge for the church leaders. How was the church supposed to ensure that the people who wanted to be baptized were doing so because they truly accepted Jesus and not just because Constantine said so or because they got wrapped up in the excitement of the Easter festival that everyone was gearing up for? How would the church prepare so many adults for this event and ensure that their lives reflected that of a true disciple of Jesus? Well, the church developed this 40-day course of preparation for baptism consisting of Bible study, catechism, and spiritual discipline such as, you guessed it, prayer and fasting. The hope was that during those 40 days, people would either be preparing their hearts for baptism or encouraging someone else who was preparing for baptism. And this, of course, provided for unity in the body. So baptism at this point in the Christian church was a huge part of the early stages of Lent leading up to Easter. And in essence, Lent was a pastoral in, uh, innovation for a time much like today where large numbers of people didn't grow up in the church and needed some biblical training before making their profession of faith. And it was the church's way of saying yes to the free offer of salvation while also saying no to cheap grace, which in this case was baptism without discipleship. So instead of a time for focusing only on the suffering and death of Jesus that took place at Easter, Lent became more focused on our union with Christ's death and the resurrection and the expression of baptism. Now one prime example of this is in Romans chapter 6 when Paul equates our baptism with Jesus' death and resurrection. He says this, Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and we were bur buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. So Paul makes it clear that when we're born again through our belief in Jesus for our salvation, that our relationship with sin is changed forever. We have died to sin, and if we died to sin, then we shouldn't live in it any longer. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, Before we were dead in sin, and now we are dead to sin. And Paul builds on this idea using the picture of going under the water in baptism as a way to equate us being buried with Christ. And as we come up from the water, it's like we're rising from the dead, being made new, which is so fitting for the build up to Easter. And this is good news. Now, as you can imagine, anyone hearing this would rush to the line to be baptized on Easter. But we know that a person can go through the act of being baptized every day of the week and twice on Sunday and yet still be a slave to sin, dead in their old lives. There's nothing magical about the water that's used for baptism. And Peter said this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
So it's not about the outward sign of the baptism, but the inward spiritual reality that it represents. The only way to overcome the reality of sin, brokenness, and our own mortality is first and foremost done through the redemptive work of Jesus, and secondly, when a person has a sincere, faith-filled request for the forgiveness of their sins and a new heart for the Lord. Wayne Grudem says in his book, Systematic Theology, it's about an inward exercise of faith that is represented by baptism. And that's what Lent was supposed to be, an inward exercise, strengthening our faith muscles through prayer, supplication, fasting, and confession, preparing us to celebrate one of the most important moments of all time. Unfortunately, the good intentions of Emperor Constantine's push for baptisms caused people to make Lent about something that it wasn't. And by default, they were making more of the outward expression of baptism and less about the inward practice of training our faith muscles, denying oneself and turning to Jesus. And rather than focusing on the beauty and the redemption bought through Jesus Christ or the practice of mourning that life in this world is not as it should be and setting our eyes on the truth that our hope resides not in the world as we know it, but in God's beautiful plan to redeem it, the season was starting to become one of superstition and one of cheap grace. And I've experienced this firsthand. The effects of an Amazon Prime culture that wants everything right now. I wanna be made clean, I want a fresh start, so can you baptize me? I got a pool, you know, Lent is here, so I'm gonna give up meat or chocolate or replace my coffee with an energy drink for a while, and at the end, I expect that that action will change my relationship with God and improve my life as a whole for the rest of the year. See, Lent isn't some Christian get sanctified quick scheme. It's also not a holy diet plan. What did Pastor Ryan say last week? We all want to earn our belonging to Christ with some wind sprints and some push-ups. This is what the Lent season was becoming for the Christians of this day and age. Works. But soon, the practice would be confronted by the reformers of the Christian faith. And by the 16th century, the memory of Lent as a season for preparing a new Christian for their baptism and their faith walk had faded away. Adult baptisms were rare and almost everyone was now baptized as an infant. The Lenten disciplines were still practiced, but the church imposed them in many different ways and it began to take on a form of works righteousness, or to keep the metaphor alive, wind sprints and push-ups. Enter reformer John Calvin. Calvin felt that the practice of teaching people about the faith that had been built around catechism was important, but he also felt that the season of Lent had become hopelessly superstitious, so much so that it couldn't be of any help to his people. And since then, the Reformed churches of Dutch heritage have historically taken a balanced view towards Lent and the church calendar as a whole, while still firmly holding on to the Reformers' rejection of certain abuses of the season. So as a Reformed church in America, we would never tell you that you must participate in Lent and how to do so. But we also would never tell you to avoid it altogether. Instead, we want to encourage you to get to know what this season of Lent is and make wise choices that promote faithful discipleship in your walk with the Lord. If you come out of a background of legalism or superstition, then you as a Reformed Christian would probably do well to follow Calvin's lead and say no to the outward expression of Lent and instead lean into the freedoms that are found in Christ. Go ahead, have that ribeye, medium rare. Dove chocolates, don't mind if I do, in moderation of course. If that's not you, then maybe there's something positive about adopting Lent as a way to train yourself and prepare for, prepare for Easter. I personally think that today in our culture, we don't see a lot of adult baptisms or professions of faith at Easter, or ever, really. And maybe we would do well to recover that idea, that Lent isn't just about Jesus suffering on the cross and dying, but that we have an opportunity to join God's redemptive plan for mankind and this world through baptism in the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The main thing that we need to fight against is making the practices and dis disciplines that are so prevalent during Lent just something that we do for a short season each year. Lent is a beautiful reminder of the fact that our life is but a vapor and that through Christ all can be redeemed. But we are called by the Word of God to continually be equipped in our faith and knowledge of God's Son so that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. And these practices should be an all year long thing. The idea that Lent is a special or holier time of self-denial than the rest of the year ought to be rejected. And as Christians, we're called to deny ourselves things that are sinful and more importantly, to deny ourselves. 
Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16, 24 through 26, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his own soul? Lastly, we should reject the idea that denying ourselves lawful things such as food or drink that God has given to us somehow elevates us to a higher spiritual level than others who don't take part in the Lent fast. If you truly believe that it's best for you to fast for a period of time and you can use the urges that come your way as fuel to pray or fuel to remind us that we can't get through this life without God, then do it. But we should never believe that it somehow elevates us higher than our brothers and sisters in the faith who aren't fasting, who don't take part in Ash Wednesday. On the flip side, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Although Lent has had its moments in history, I like the way that Justin Smidstra of the Young Calvinist put it. He said, we must be careful that in condemning the errors and abuses of Lent, we do not throw out the whole thing. We can end up unconsciously violating Christian liberty when, out of a desire to defend Christian liberty from the abuses of Lent, we condemn someone who employs his or her Christian liberty by choosing to do certain lawful things during Lent. Fasting is not only a legitimate practice, it's something scripture tells us to do. Material things such as food, drink, entertainment are certainly good gifts of God, but who will deny that they can often get in the way of our spiritual lives? How often do we not find ourselves so busy with the affairs and things of this life, with work, with making and saving money, that we neglect our spiritual lives? Material things, good things, always have the potential to clutter up our souls just as they clutter up and accumulate in our houses. Fasting helps us unclutter and move our focus away from the material things to spiritual things. Lent offers a time to do just that, if we do so with the right motives. There's a lot of black areas when it comes to observing Lent, but there are also a number of legitimate gray areas that we ought to leave in the realm of Christian liberty. Whether we consider Lent something not worth observing, or if we use the season as an opportunity to devote ourselves to prayer and meditation on Christ, we must always do these things out of a right heart with spiritual motivation. So, this season, really consider what Lent is all about. Be prepared to answer people's questions about Lent, about the ashes, about why you are or aren't giving something up. Think about how the spiritual training of fasting, prayer, almsgiving, preparing our hearts and what making a profession of faith could look like in your life. Work diligently to ensure that Lent doesn't become something that points to your own works, but instead points others to the grace that so freely washes over us because of what Jesus did on the cross. Let it point people to the hope that is found in our chance for a new life because of what Jesus did when death was arrested that Easter morning. Let's pray. Father God, we need you. As we walk through this season of Lent, you point out the clutter in our lives. Show us the areas where our priorities have become mixed and help us to discipline our lives in such a way that you become the head of our lives once more. Refocus our hearts today, Lord. Help us to be more aware of the people whom your heart breaks for. Remind us that you came to us, and therefore, we should be good neighbors and go in love to others in need. Be gentle with us, Lord, as we lament our shortcomings and sinful desires. We are weak, but you make us strong. To you be the glory and honor for all our days. Amen. Let's worship God together.
just rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free, washing so TCC, in this season of Lent, hear this benediction from Ephesians chapter 3, 17 through 19, and apply it to your daily lives today. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know that the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. Go in peace.